Welcome to the Shipping Forecast 2017. 2016 certainly was a transformational year and not for all the right reasons. The sign of the times was quite an unhappy one where our favourite topic of leadership dominated the headlines. Farage and Trump seemed to ignite the desire in so many for change and transition away from the old into, it appears, anything new. Alan de Botton summed it up all with this poignant tweet only a few weeks ago, and we'll be talking about everything from leadership to therapy to fear and to love in the next 40 minutes. It's a powerful set of themes for me to have to navigate. Before we start, please can I thank Detail for the opening with such a haunting, powerful vocal on a truly iconic track. British talent, fresh off tour with Sigma. You may recognise his voice from Somebody to Love, the massive hit of the summer. He'll be back to sing to us with a happier love song in 40 minutes' time. Thanks, Dan. So the Lighthouse team and I are beyond thrilled that so many of us can join us again. It's a night we look forward to, but we never, ever assume your attendance, so we're very, very pleased to see so many of you here, and thank you. And thank you to everyone who contributed to the survey, and indeed everyone who's trusting enough to allow us to represent them both professionally and personally in our industry. As always, you know, we appreciate your continual encouragement with all that we do, and we very much hope you enjoy the entire evening, even though the missives tonight are a little heavier than usual, you are warned. There is no fake news here tonight. Rather, we are the purveyors of the whole truth, so help us all. But I'll do my best to throw in the odd gag or two uh, to ease the message if I can. Now, as you know at The Lighthouse, we are deeply passionate about the world of talent, the search to find it, the desire to acquire it, and the hope and wish of keeping it. And increasingly over the last few years, we have sought to extend our interest in this intricate psychological understanding of the human condition, how best we can master ourselves and our powerful minds. We hope it has served to deepen our ability to truly understand you, the leaders, and the talent within our industry. We take very seriously the matter of your professional futures and your personal dreams. Since our launch in 2009, and Tom George, I know, is here tonight, so thank you, Tom and Steve Hatch, because they were the first people to ever have any faith that we could do what we do, so thank you. It's never forgotten. We've made it our mission to change the reputation of headhunters by providing a truly dynamic, talent-rich, and highly personal executive search experience. It's fueled by our constant desire to create victorious partnerships between the most coveted companies to work for and the world-class talent that you are and we remain committed to constantly uncovering and nurturing the very best leaders in our industry, and you're all part of that here tonight. The results of our eighth New World Talent Survey will take centre stage, originally conceived to understand the opinions, the views, and the inner thoughts of our industry's leading lights, and these findings continue to act as a critical barometer engaging the strength and vibrancy of our sector. The narrative of this evening, and indeed the report that accompanies the research, serves to qualify many of the themes, patterns and hypotheses that the Lighthouse Company identifies through the 5,000 plus conversations we have with senior leaders every year. Previous years have borne witness to the rise of the horizontal hybrid, the shock of the equity epidemic, and the challenge of our estranged encounters. And we hope 2017's results will prove equally engaging and insightful for your year ahead. Along with the annual barometer, we will be introducing two new distinct and emerging themes, this year being Lost at C-Suite, covering transformational leadership and ageism, and the Psyched Index. You will find the printed summary of the shipping forecast report, along with some other wonderful items in your goodie bags. We introduced you to Yolom, as you might remember last year. We're moving you up to Professor Stephen Joseph and Victor E. Frankel with some popcorn and hydration thrown in for your whole self-health. More of that later. Please be sure to take your bags from one of our lovely team on your way out later. They'll be upstairs just by the front door. So we have much to discuss. Please get comfortable. If you're standing, hang on to the person next to you. And we trust by 8 p.m. you'll be enjoying cold drinks, canapes, and conversations with those that you really would like to talk to. So let's start properly with hopefully some brighter news just before we get to the results. We at Lighthouse actually had quite a good year, but it was very busy and very fulfilling. And despite the temperamental market shifts and wider economic concerns, our business grew 30% and we undertook over hundreds of board level searches and consultancy projects, mostly at CEO, managing director and CRO level. We're incredibly proud of every individual and every company that we work with and we hope you know that to create these partnerships and we hope to catch up with you later too. 
We continue to spend our time between London and New York, flying between the two, and meeting new talent, strengthening the phenomenal leadership stable that we try to look after. We welcome six new members to our team in the last year. Joe Daly, Relationships Director, Beck Lowe supporting Bella, Gwen, our design and marketing manager, who is responsible for so much of the beauty this evening, so do thank her if you see her. Kim Townsend, who looks after me, as long as Rebecca, so they both need an absolute medal. And Sam Jordan, our research coordinator, and Emma Powell, who works with Tony Samways. And following the launch of Psyched, the second Lighthouse Group business last year, Ben McKee, my co-founder and partner, has braved the shores of the corporate world following 20 years in only the therapeutic space. Our tuck shop and our dirty jokes have been a highlight, but I'm unsure he'll ever participate in the fancy dress obsession or our Tuesday night boxing classes to the level that we would really quite like. More on Ben later. We continue as co-founders and chair advisory council for Advertising Week Europe. I know Rebecca and the team are here tonight, so welcome. We continue to share our knowledge and wisdom towards education, equality and confidence with the younger generations through projects such as Ideas Britain, Speakers for Schools, and at the same time taking to the stage at events such as the Telegraph Festival of Media, Marie Claire at Work Live, I know Trish is here tonight, hello Trish, and mentoring for Wackle and speaking at many other of our clients' in-house global training programmes. In 2016, we continue to host our very special Tomorrow's Life Choice events, aimed at those aged 15 to 18, debating the next moves post-school. And thanks to our stellar bunch of industry mentors, I know some are here tonight, Ella, I've seen you, we're able to deliver authentic and real-life skills and advice to many of our clients' gorgeous children and allow wisdom and experience to be shared. Then, after being persuaded by Tom Tomasi, my boss, 25 years ago, um, I joined the board of NSPCC in Childline last year, and we supported the famous annual board committee with a lot of your help in the room. And we managed to raise about £825,000 on the night, and further activity took the total to beyond £1 million for the important 30th year. The Lighthouse also adopted Childline as our corporate charity. And you know us, when we adopt something, we take it incredibly seriously. So seriously, that we decided to launch and deliver an event audaciously named Quizmasters of the Mediaverse. It saw David Wilding finally realise his dream of presenting Blankety Blank live, and Barry Couples bringing his Wheeler Dealer prowess to life in a thrilling live showdown of The Price is Right. And I must just comment that Greg Grimmer, who is sadly in Tokyo tonight, proved he still knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. Chardler now receives over four million contacts via either phone or web, and yet only three out of four calls are actually able to be answered. With the greater need for support, especially around mental health in children, what matters was that we got together as an industry and raised a huge amount of money that evening, which in practical terms paid for over 5,000 additional calls to be answered by a Chardline trained counsellor. So congratulations to ITV, who currently hold the crown for now, and a huge thank you to all 26 teams who generously bought a table. Thank you. Talking of tables, we launched a series of Captain's Table events at Lighthouse, which saw industry leaders join us on many occasions from Wackle Dinners, our legendary lunch at Cannes, and the regular CEO and Victoria's partnership lunches that we do with many of you. Spending time with you in this way allows us to really have a high-touch and emotionally invested relationship with you that we really value. Time is always precious, and we always value you. So it's been a very busy year. To the survey. Brace yourselves, it's going to be a journey through the darkness to get to the light. And just to remind you, the survey was originally commissioned back in 2009 to ratify and quantify some of the many patterns and behaviours, and rather than simply trust our anecdotal observations, we instead wanted to ask you, the very people who are leading this sector, to share with us your own opinions on not just what you're seeing, but how you're feeling. And as we've come to expect, given the survey is fully confidential, across all subsequent years, you've been generous enough to share often raw feelings and stark opinions for which we are unswervingly grateful. So let's start with how you're feeling and keep in mind what lies beneath. On the face of it, you as our industry leader are very content in your current position. 71% of you survey claim to be fulfilled in your role. Rising 30% points since 2015, this score continues to improve year on year. However, when considered alongside some of our other barometer results, perhaps this sentiment is symptomatic of a wider desire to avoid rocking the boat rather than your true contentment. Let me tell you why. When asked about growth prospects of your business in 2017, we saw a decrease in your confidence and an increase in your concern. 
What appears an initial positive result should be observed alongside a consistent decline in confidence since 2015, and we anticipate an undercurrent of disquiet. If this trend continues, we may see 2018's confidence score slump to lows not seen since the depths of the recession in 2008. And while the continued increase in our leaders' career fulfilment may lead you to believe we have a more stable workforce, the response of those surveyed appear to run very much counter to this. 39% of leaders have contemplated leaving the industry, that's up 44% year on year, and 58% have considered moving companies, which is on par with 2016. With an all-time high of 39% of you also considering to set up your own business, the industry continues to breed an entrepreneurial mindset. But cumulatively, 85% of those questioned have thought about making significant changes within their careers, a figure that has risen considerably year on year. There is a definite sense of our leadership fraternity witnessing a period of uncertainty, and from our vantage point, the level of leadership transients could present a potential danger to our industry. And when it comes to succession management, we find a continual, distinctly average score, despite repeated calls and requests for it to be given greater attention. It's not lost on us at the Lighthouse, and the task of designing a healthy succession management plan is something we continually ask, ask to consult on. When asked about where you'd like to work next in the media industry, 2017's findings remain broadly in line with previous years. Media owners remaining top choice, while the agency world has rallied back to a position comparable with figures not seen since 2014 at 21%. The desire for leaders' next role to be client-side remains as popular as it was last year, with 10% choosing this option and increasingly becoming a reality, with the likes of Nick Ashley from Mindshare, Michelle McKendrick from BBH, who obviously have both successfully joined Tesco. However, there were two notable points to watch for the future. Firstly, a three-year decline in those wishing to join a tech business appears to point to two things. The infiltration of technology across every part of our industry, it's no longer seen really as a thing of its own, and we would agree with that. But the cash-burning disappearance of many tech firms who could not find their niche in a tough market. Who to back remains a concern for the many candidates that we talk to when we're looking at roles in these businesses. And secondly, on closer examination of desired agency moves, we continue to see a decline for specialists, but offset by a fourfold rise in those looking to join an integrated group. A return to the new model of full service, such as Havas Village and Dentsu's 1PL, is certainly now appealing to our leaders. Now, given we're headhunters, we are obviously naturally curious as to which of the most critical elements you consider when contemplating your next move. It is actually never a surprise to us at the Lighthouse that money is rarely a top three driver, although, of course, it's important. As you can see from this year's results, growth prospects, value and purpose, and leadership are the most potent persuaders. A first-time option for 2017, an organisation's values and purpose was scored as the second most persuasive, and the clear articulation of these, ironically, was cited as critical. However, when we posted our one-trick question in the survey this year around how clear are your vision, purpose and values, only 24% stated very clear. And as far as we're concerned, if they're not very clear, they're not very useful at all, so work has got to be done. So 71% of you are fulfilled, 85% of you are thinking about making a change. So we know that two out of the three most important messages for growth prospects and vision and values are not hitting it out of the park. So that just leaves leadership. And we've had a big delve in here this year. Another deep breath is required. Entitled Lost at C-Suite, the search for transformational leaders was certainly an important theme this year. Given the effects of relentless disruption, ensuring the right leadership dynamics are at play within our organisation is key for the sector's overall health. Few can deny the unprecedented period of transformation we're facing and the rate of change by which it's occurring. At the Lighthouse, we're asked on a weekly basis to find transformational leaders and CEOs. And yet, in the last 12 months, we've noticed a palpable decline in the number of leaders willing or able to truly autonomously lead a brave and dynamic vision. Zenga Folkman, who specialise in transformational leadership globally, have undertaken many studies into the dramatic effect of good leaders, poor leaders, and great leaders. So it is no wonder, as an industry in high transition such as ours, that we seek the clear rewards that a great leader can deliver. So we're curious. Was it just our quality bar that we're setting too high, or was there an emerging concern to be tackled? So we asked you. 
And starting with that are the most desirable traits of a transformational leader. And you said, a combination of vision and courage highlights the importance of forward thinking and gumption to be brave enough to make the right decisions for now and for the future. And this was counterbalanced by the human capacity to connect with those around us. 47 claimed authenticity was hugely desirable, with another 44 citing the capacity to engage with all employees as critical. Today's leaders need to be seen, they need to be heard, and they need to be understood. However, rather worryingly, the very traits that are most desirable are also the characteristics sadly deemed to be currently the most lacking in our industry. Almost 70% of those surveyed cited six common qualities they believe to be most absent in our leaders, and they were a lack of vision, a lack of authenticity, a lack of ability to engage with all, a lack of courage. And to make matters even worse, you cited a further two to really ram the message home, a lack of bravery, a lack of transparency. It's a damning list. It does get better, I promise. But where there is a pattern, there is always a story. And we wanted to try and go deeper and understand why and what we can collectively understand and then do to change it. Two key points dominated the majority of our respondents' answers to the primary reason this apparent absence is there for the transformational leaders. Firstly, 33% blamed the growing need to conform to a corporate or network way of working. I'm sure that resonates with some of you in the room. We are, giving, are we giving our leaders enough room to really do things their way? Whether you're at IPG or you're at Google, there is an understanding that your ability as a domestic leader can be somewhat hampered or curtailed by needing to conform to a parent who lives overseas. It's a challenge, and many find ingenious ways to overcome it, but we're left wondering if we're breeding enough uh, sort of courageous leaders, and if not, what must we do to make a culture and a pathway for them to thrive and grow? And secondly, there is a palpable fear of those in high-profile, high-stake companies of getting it wrong. Transformation of a business is an exciting but at times brutal journey and one which requires the leader to often brave the fear of the riptide which is needed to be survived by both the company and the individual in helping them swim to new shores. To be offered the capacity to learn, to fail, to course correct and experiment appears to have narrowed given the pressures on exponential growth and delivery to VCs and shareholders. And so we must always wonder if the risk and reward is great enough to dive into at time a savage sea. A recent Harvard report revealed the biggest personal stressor at work was understandably the potential fear of losing our jobs, increasing our odds of poor health by 50%. Perhaps we need to do more to ensure the human capital of our industry has been nurtured and does not feel overly disposable. When a business needs to transition, whether that be The Guardian, Hearst, Channel 4, for example, we should be taking more time to support and encourage those who bravely venture uncharted seas on behalf of us all. So we're currently in danger of not breeding enough dynamic leaders, perhaps. But what are we doing with those who have led beautifully for many years? Let's talk about ageism. Diversity, inclusion, equality, there's never been a greater focus on fairness in the industry, and gender agenda has never been far from 2016 headlines, and we rightly expect this to continue. However, this year we investigated an area of imbalance that most of us will expect to encounter in our lifetime, age. Two years ago, we asked our leaders what age they believed they would leave the industry. 70% said between the age of 51 and 60, with a thir further 13% anticipating continuing their careers until well into their 60s, which was highly at odds with the fact that the IPA stated the majority will leave the industry for good before they reach the age of 50. It was a shock to many. Almost three quarters of those surveyed this year believe less than 20% of their company is aged 45 plus. Yet our respondents state mature employees provide a truly human upside in the workplace. Why wouldn't they? Emotional maturity, resilience, insightfulness, as well as the great benefit of accumulated business knowledge and, of course, your established networks. However, could it be the articulation, accumulation, sorry, of this legacy knowledge is providing a barrier to older workers, with the modern skill deficiencies being cited as the greatest challenge for employers, followed by expense, your organisational fit, and change resistance all scoring highly? At all stages of our career, we must ask ourselves how much of what we have accumulated remains relevant and what can be decluttered to create space for new learning. The trappings of the past, be that what we know, what we do, even what we earn, may not be what we can expect to have in the future working world. 
like an ingenious mobile phone from 1987 that we were proud to adopt so early. If constant upgrades have not been put in place, you may become obsolete in rather a brutal fashion. But don't get confused or defensive about your personal digital usage versus knowledge. That comes up a fair amount in our interviews. You don't need to be on Snapchat or Insta every five minutes, but you do need to know how they work for the consumer and therefore your clients, agencies and advisors. It's about context. Take the late and beloved Felix Dennis, for example, a man who famously never owned or used a mobile phone, but who insisted, he told me at Advertising Week once at Ronnie Scott's, that he was sent every model so he could play with it, discover its usage and purpose for his consumers, and then discard it once again. But let's be frank, when do we know the end of our current career may be ending? When we asked you, you said you would know if the leadership tenure had reached its sell-by date. The primary reason was very clear. Nearly half claimed they would no longer feel an innate sense of passion for their business, scoring three times higher than any other factor. However, we believe this loss of passion can be overcome by ensuring the overstretched leadership mind retains the capacity and allows themselves to apply what makes them curious once again. I'd like you to meet 68-year-old Billy. These are the spectacular Orkney Islands, the most remote of which is North Ronaldsea, home to the very industrious Billy Muir. The 68-year-old has been declared Britain's busiest man. Blimey, is that time already? Astonishingly, Billy has at least 20 jobs. I'm not a workaholic, no, no, no. I simply like working and I have the strength to do it. First stop in his packed day is the island's airport, where Billy is air traffic controller. Logan 314 North Ronaldsea Ops. Baggage handler and taxi driver. And that's not all he does for visitors. North Ronaldsea Holiday Cottages. I want to secure a good future for this island and I'll do everything in my power to make that happen. One thing we're not short of is wind. But there is a shortage of working labor with just 50 people on the island. And that's why Billy's so busy. The job Billy takes most pride in is making sure that whatever the weather, the island's coast is safe. It's one of my favorite jobs out of all of what I do. Finally, with all his many jobs done, it's home to his ever-supportive wife, Isabel. Where have you been? I've been working all day. Could we have a cup of coffee, please? Right, give you a cup of coffee. I have a blooming phone going there. <laughs> Hello? Give me five minutes and I'll come and see what I can do. Come on, cheerio. He's clearly also my Addison Lee driver at the end there, so wonderful, good for Billy. But listen, it shows it can be done, and thank you for ITB to that clip. Fundamentally, age should not be a barrier to continued success. In many industries, such as biotech and business software, you will know that years of wisdom provide a clear advantage. According to the Kaufman Foundation, the average age of a successful startup founder in these accelerating industries is actually 40, and with those aged 55, almost plus, it's twice as likely to launch a high-growth business as those aged 20 to 30. For. It is never too late. If we can make room in our minds and our hearts to continually learn and inquire, no matter our magic number, we'll remain relevant and open to the future. Wisdom and experience are valuable assets, and it's time that we reappraised, I think, in our industry. So in summary, for C-Suite, the need for the human, visionary, brave leader has never been more sought after or needed, and we must support them when they take the helm. Age is a number. Let go of old knowledge, views, behaviours and methods to allow space for the new to come through. Relevancy, curiosity and vibrancy are key. We need leaders who are honest and brave and authentic. Where are you on that scale? What do you need to do to remain or gain your place in the league of individuals who truly make a difference to our fascinating and wonderful business? And so, to our second and final emerging observation. Since 2013, we've been curious about how you are, how you really are, 
and observing the number of people who are keen to either improve their mental performance and well-being or indeed address underlying emotional challenges that sometimes get in the way of our progress and our accomplishment. This year, we wanted to set a more formal benchmark within the industry for how we were doing and what needed to happen for you as leaders and for those whom you lead. In recent years, we've become increasingly enlightened to the needs of both our cognitive and emotional selves and the ability to consider the whole self and how we interact with our wider environment. And it's not before time. The ever-increasing expectations, growing demands and always-on mindset faced by our leading executives can threaten even the sharpest, brightest and most resilient of minds. It would come as no surprise to anyone at the pinnacle of their career that the World Health Organization has cited stress as the number one health epidemic of the 21st century. What we're seeing when we're dealing with leaders across the world is there's an absolute growth of anxiety and stress and the necessity to be always on and to work at a particular pace, which whilst incredibly impressive, it's really taking its toll physically and mentally on people. And the irony is that the very people who are able to have that amount of resilience, have that amount of ability, are experts at masking what's really going on within. And what we're finding is that people are underneath all of that, worried about what's happening for them, how they should be being, how they should be performing. And so what is it they can do for themselves privately or within a group to really address all of that, to bring themselves back to a healthier place both mentally and physically. Organisations are beginning to take more responsibility and are starting to finally understand they have a duty of care and actually that it makes more sense and it's far more cost effective to look after the people that they value. As we experience new things we create new thinking which cultivates new neural pathways and we can move from an old pattern or way of thinking to a new one. This allows us to see choices which may not have been visible before. With choice comes the possibility to behave differently. When we behave differently, we are able to engage in new experiences and the result of any experience is emotion. New experience creates new feeling, creates new thinking, creates new being. In 2016, the Mental Health at Work report, which I recommend you seek and read, highlighted the concerning fact that 77% of employees have been affected by symptoms of poor mental health in the last year, with 62% of employees attributing their symptoms directly to work or feeling work was a contributing factor. In January this year, the UK Prime Minister, Theresa May, acknowledged that for too long, mental well-being has been shrouded in completely unacceptable stigma and dangerously disregarded as a secondary issue to physical health. In response to this developing dialogue, the Lighthouse last year in this very room launched Psyched, which was specifically designed to take care of the modern day leaders, the whole self, and guide them in supporting the people that they lead. As we look to the results of our Psyched Index, this survey has garnered, it seems that our timing was critical. There is no mistaking that mental health in the workplace can be a challenging topic that has to be handled incredibly well, and there really isn't an option for a halfway house. Knowing the processes of your organisation has for supporting those who seek to improve their mental performance is arguably more important than knowing what to do yourself. The good news is 96% of our leaders felt some level of responsibility towards the well-being of their teams. You care and you notice.
However, due to the expectations of you and your businesses, the majority of you also acknowledge you regularly have to prioritise the interests of the business over the well-being of your team members, something I'm sure brings conflict to you within. Add to that the further confirmation that in line with the National Mental Wellbeing Survey, the majority of people in your organisation, yourselves included, have experienced one or several work contributing symptoms, either mental, physical or behavioural, then the triumvirate is set. You care, you're feeling at some point guilty and you are aware. With the proof of firm that is happening in your own backyard, we then asked you how well your organisation supported people with their mental well-being. And sadly, the majority felt they didn't know, they were unsure or admitted not very well. The support more often is not there. One of the reasons for this may well be something the Mental Health Report also highlighted in 2016. And so we mirrored the question in our survey to you. What are you most comfortable talking about at work? And this time, we've indexed our industry against the national averages. When looking at which topics our industry leaders are comfortable talking about in the workplace is a clear sign of great progress in some areas. There is no doubt the sterling work of organisations such as Wackle, combined with the growing public reprimand of misogynistic behaviour, has helped 70% of our leaders be more open in talking about gender at work, 13% greater than managers across all industries. Similarly, relationships with others, sexual orientation, physical health conditions and race are conversation topics that the majority of your industry leaders are very happy to have. However, at the opposite end of the spectrum, there are three topics which appear to be taboo. Mental health, disability and religion. Perhaps driven by the discomfort and fear of potentially saying the wrong thing or remaining tentative in approach, it's clear we still have work to do in moving into a place where we're comfortable to engage and connect, no matter the subject. Only 52% of our leaders feel comfortable talking about disability, this despite continued mainstream exposure of the topic through the likes of AMV's powerful work from Maltesers and the amazing success of Channel 4's The Last Leg and their Superhumans campaign, just to name a few. This score is clearly 20% lower than that of all managers across all industries. However, as leaders, we do have a duty of care for the mental health and performance of our employees, yet half of us feel, still feel uncomfortable talking about it at work. We owe it to both ourselves and to those that we lead to try and crack this pervasive culture of silence around the topics of anxiety and depression to truly become a sector who utilise the growing understanding of the human mind to unlock the potential and the future growth and the success of our people. Last year, the New World Talent Survey concluded that leaders in the advertising, media and technology sector were ready to redress the balance of their cognitive and emotional selves. 80% of those we surveyed were open to the idea of psychoeducation and therapeutic programmes to aid professional development. And of these, 25 had already had some form of therapy to develop themselves, while another quarter were actively now considering it. This year, the Psych Index asked our leaders directly which area of your personal well-being their organisation could provide them to support with what was their preference. Almost 8 out of 10 of our respondents proactively chose support for non-physical, with 61% opting specifically for help with their mental well-being. Peak performance begins and ends with all parts of our working capital and our human potential. And while we still encounter workplace reticence when talking about mental well-being, there is no denying the conversation is getting louder, with ears more willing to listen and a clear desire for organisational support within our industry. The time is certainly now. But the stigma remains, and there is one final part to our findings which I find the most challenging. We asked you, as leaders, to score your physical and your mental well-being, then those of your leadership team, and then those of your overall employees, and something curious happened. It seemed you were doing fine, less so your leadership teams physically, but the differential was only 12%. However, when we asked you about your mental well-being, you reported to be even stronger yourselves, and those of your leadership and wider teams was up to 28% different. Now, I sit with many of you and talk to you about a lot of things, and many of you are now engaged with Sight professionally and some personally, and confidentiality obviously remains forever watertight. But is this the truth? Or well, there is an element of, it's you and not me that's still in play.
As leaders, we're great at masking. We have to for the survival in a competitive world, but you have a duty of care to remain brave and transparent and open. It will only be in you embracing the new world of mental performance and well-being that you allow others to also find their voice. Let's not remain in the shadow of shame and Edwardian beliefs around our minds. They are glorious and wonderful things, and we all need to get psyched. So we've clearly been seeing that's an issue. This is, the, is what it is and why it's manifesting. And the best I can now do is to share with you what you can do about it. And I don't care if you work with Psyched or instead another organisation or individual, but work with something and work with someone. At Psyched, we spent the last six months testing, piloting and trying out programmes and methods to see if we can find a way to bridge the gap, to make connection and to demonstrate to the most open and guarded, cynical and optimistic minds whether it was finally time to be as proud of your corporate development in the boardroom with your coach and your physical well-being in the gym with your trainer as you were of your mental strength and understanding and your whole self with your therapist. Tonight, let me give you just the headlines of the programmes we've been developing for this industry and wider afield, and how you might want to get involved personally and professionally in 2017. Here are gorgeous practitioners. The breadth is medical, clinical, spiritual, and they're best in class. A Wu Dang master, a Shaolin monk. We've got a doctor called Dr. Tickle, who's in the room tonight. That's her real name, and we absolutely adore her. We've got psychotherapists, we've got doctors, we've got nutritionists in pizza. So everything about you, we can take care of and look after and really understand what it is that you need. Ben McKee has been in the industry for a very long time and has handpicked people that he just knows are best in class. There are four programs and ways to engage. Individual therapy, if you think it's time that you would like to have some therapy, or as a leader, you want to provide an on-site therapist within your organisation. We are currently talking to businesses about providing that in the same way you would coaching or hypnotherapy or other, other parts to looking after individuals. Psychoeducation in groups and board education. Ben and I are currently seeing a number of businesses to give psychoeducation around what to spot, what you can do privately, what you can do on the NHS, what you can do to help people understand in groups how to connect better, either as board or departmental groups instead. We have retreats in France for leadership teams. It's a five-day retreat, and again, every day starts with physical Qigong as the sun comes up. You're swimming in lakes, you're doing psychotherapy, you're doing group therapy, you're doing nutrition, you're doing exercise, you're doing coaching, everything you might need to really reconnect with who you are and be more of who you really are. And then for the creative and editorial types, I know we've got Paul from Contagious in the room, going to the desert, to Morocco, Egypt, and trekking out on camels with psychotherapists to really connect back into your creativity, to open the mind, to really have an adventure, if you like. Ben and I are visiting lots of companies and boards over the next six weeks to try and educate you, as we've discussed. And there's also a number of psyched alumni in the room tonight. So get curious. It's a wonderful gift and an adventure to take. So as we come to the final straight of tonight's presentation, it's time to quickly run through the part we know you lot love so much, industry performance. And every year you're polled to nominate No Holds Barred, those you believe have done well, and those that you think need to pull their socks up, and 2017 is no different. First up, which business did you really feel performed in 2016? Congratulations to Facebook for remaining in the leadership position, but sad to see no creative agencies featuring this year. But thank the Lord for Mike, Philippa, Darren, Veritza, Patrick and the team for saving agency reputation at last. And welcome to Claire, Imran, the Snap team for making your debut. However, all the positive gain there is an equal amount of pain. As we know, we're going to ask you which business you felt could have performed better in 2016. I'm ready for something from Bruce Daisley. You replied Twitter, Facebook, news brands, The Guardian and Hearst. There are a lot of companies named here, I have to tell you, that spread very thinly across the scoring. So you're not in these five. You may have just about got away with it. But that said, isn't it heartbreaking to see news brands named as an overall business? If Project Rio ever needed justification, surely it is this. And if there's one thing the year-on-year -year results have also taught us, that these results really show a snapshot in time. With James Wildman taking the helm at Hearst, Evelyn Webster joining The Guardian, I'm sure we will see change again next year. And although he's not here, I must congratulate Nigel at Yahoo for moving his business out of this set year-on-year. -year. So this year's shipping forecast report also looked at those that you receive 
can look at open quotes as to what people want to do. And one of the quotes we've actually put into our, our uh, research report this year, which is, if the highest aim of a captain were to preserve his ship, he would keep it in port forever. The leaders that we have in our industry have to do with some of the most disruptive and choppy seas in our sector. And when we asked which individual leader you felt had performed particularly well in 2016, it was no surprise to see Sir Martin, James Wildman, Jenny Bigham, Steve at Facebook, and of course, Darren Rubins at PhD. Not forgetting the raft of media owner and agency talent that we can see just snapping at their heels. When we asked which one company you would be inspired to work for in 2017, the startling response was all media owners, with zero change in brands, only positions, with Facebook in first place, followed, closely followed by Google and Snap. But the battle of TV versus digital platforms and even pegging from either side in our top performance means, I'm looking forward to see how J.A., Kelly, Dags and Rachel might tackle this in 2017. With recurring things be becoming more apparent, we then asked, who would you most like to work for in 2017 as a person? And the overwhelming response was, yourself. We've seen this trend grow for a few years now, and I can advocate it, but it becomes more apparent as the years go forward that actually to consult, to set up on your own, or to go it alone is your next big career move. However, we had a strong new entrant in Elon Musk, ex-founder of PayPal, now SpaceX and Tesla, worth $13 billion, 45, and allegedly recently single. He has certainly grabbed your imagination. And so to this year's fantasy hire. For the first time, Bruce wobbled him in 2012, but Sir Martin drops to fourth place with the rise again of the Americans in Obama in Elon. Good luck in being able to afford either of them. The funny answers, well, we had Bernie Eccleston. I'm sure somebody from Wackle surely voted for him after Adweek last year. Carol Vorderman, someone from the Solus Club, I'd imagine might have voted for her. Steven Spielberg, taking content a bit too far. And the very wonderful Jerry Bullmore, who could possibly not want to hire him. And this year, we specifically asked, given our Lost at C-Suite theme, who your transformational leader of the year would be for 2016. Many of you struggled to name anyone, ratifying further our Lost at C-Suite observation. But thankfully, Jenny, James, Mike Cooper at PhD, and Steve Hatch continue to show us the way. We're inspired by all of you. So before I leave the stage tonight, a couple of really quick things to mention. Firstly, Advertising Week Europe, as we rev up for the final sort of start of the five years, starting on the 20th of March, we're expecting another bumper one. The Lighthouse will bring in a session on risky business, the art of reinvention, the commercial conscience, and Sight will be delivering a very special session, including a world-renowned psychologist and a Muslim spaceman. Tomorrow's Life Choices will be happening on the 25th of April at Lighthouse Towers, so please register your children. These dates are all in your report that you're going to pick up in your goodie bag. Twitter and Lighthouse Partner again at the Cannes Lunch. That'll be happening on the 20th of June for our most loyal clients. The Childline Ball is the 28th of September. Letters will be hitting your desk. The rumour is that it's in Simon Cowell's diary, because this year it's um, Britain's Got Talent is the theme. And backed by popular demand, Quizmasters of the Mediaverse, watch out ITV, returns on the 22nd of November here at Café de Paris. We'll be looking for your team entries in the spring. And two finalists. I have to share with you that this will be the last time I will be here making this presentation alone. I have been undertaking a rather important search at Lighthouse, ably assisted by Nick Hallswell, my long-term chairman, and thank you, Nick, and some sharp advice and encouragement from Mr. Mark Cramner, who I secretly fancy, in hiring the Lighthouse as a CEO. They will be joining our business, this individual, in a couple of months and is well known to all of you. So watch the press. I think you're going to like them. And finally, finally, as you know, we love working with entrepreneurial, exciting and hyper-growth companies. And so tonight, given the very special relationship we have with Ian James and Tom and his growing team at Verve, the local mobile marketplace, he has kindly offered to generously make sure we are suitably fed and watered for the rest of the evening. And after those results, I think we need him to lift our spirits, literally. So Ian, in return for your kindness, we're going to pay it forward. Given the year we had in 2016 and the need to pull together, to collaborate, to respond, to talk, to show care and love, we're going to invite the wonderful detail to return to the stage. Having honoured the late Prince, we wanted to make a nod to George Michael too. It's not originally his song, but he made it a hit. And the lyric in it says, 
I'll be loving you always. So tonight we want you to set the tone for the year ahead together and invite you to get your phones out. Dan will not mind while he's singing. Connect to the Verve Wi-Fi and email a message to someone who has been loving you this year over the last 12 months, either professionally or personally. We sometimes all need to lead the way when it comes to love. Don't make it rude. And we'd like to express ours to you for listening and for participating in so many ways over the last eight years. Our beam will always be on for you, and there is much love in our light. Good night. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks, Kathleen. Thank you, everyone.